Oh, one note about while loops. Writing code, I think, is obviously helpful. Running code, I think, is helpful. Um, the flowchart, I think, is helpful. Sometimes I think it's also helpful just to be able to see the code we wrote and have it annotated. So in the chapter six slides, I've actually annotated with, hey, here's the initialization, here's the condition, here's the body where we do something, print, and we update that loop variable, that condition. Um, so hopefully this helps you as well. All right, here's our flow chart for a for loop. A for loop, this for loop in Java is not like the for loop that you may have learned in Python. So I just want to say that up front. It's different. The for loop in Java is structurally, I think, the most complicated and confusing of the looping structures. That said, once you get comfortable with the structure, it is the least error prone to use when you know how many times you want your loop to run. Okay. So um, we're just going to get comfortable with the structure. We're just going to practice it until we're, we're good with that. With the for loop, inside the for statement itself, inside the parentheses after for, three different things are done. There's an initialization part, which is executed just once. There's a condition that gets evaluated, just like in the while loop. If it's true, there's the body of the for loop, just like the while loop. But the updating the loop variable part isn't part of the body, it's part of the for statement itself. And then we go and evaluate the condition again. And we repeat that until the condition evaluates to false. So let's take a look in the code of what that looks like. So we're going to write another method here, and let's call it for example. Public static void for example. And we'll write a comment block describing what exactly a for loop is and what these three parts are, and then we'll do an example together. For loop. There are three parts of the for loop statement. Part number one, initialization. This is executed once. Conceptually, it's like the line of code we had before a while ago. Same idea. Two, there is the condition which is the Boolean expression evaluated at the start of each iteration. And three, just like before with the while loop, we update the loop variable, variable. This is, I think, the confusing part of a for loop. So when does the loop variable get updated? Well. It's executed at the end of each iteration. Before evaluating the condition again. Let's see what that looks like in code. Please type, at least for now, please type your for loop the same way that I'm going to type my for loop, which is I'm going to split the for statement over three lines in my program. So I'm going to write for, and I'm going to have my curly bracket, my I'm sorry, my parenthesis, open my parenthesis, and I'm going to say for int count equals one. We're going to do the exact same thing in this method that we did in the previous method. We're going to print the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. This is the initialization. On my next line, I'm going to say count is less than or equal to 5. That's the condition. Notice that we haven't closed the parentheses 
and we do have a semicolon after the initialization, and we have a semicolon after the condition. This is the first part of the for loop. This is the second part of the for loop. And here is the third part of the for loop. Count plus plus. Now that we have all three parts, we close the parenthesis. We do not put in the semicolon. And this is where we update the loop variable. After having all three parts separated by semicolons of our four statement, we then have the curly brackets which define the body. And in the body, we're going to say system.out.println count. And that is the body. And like we did before, let's print when we're done. Cool. This loop does the same thing that the while loop does that we wrote first. The structure is a little bit different. And it takes a little bit of getting used to. One tool that I think is really, really helpful for helping us understand how a for loop is executed is the debugger. So I'm going to set a breakpoint at the start of the for loop here. And then I'm going to run the debugger so that we can see which statements are executed when. And I think this makes a big difference. So I'm going to slide this over here. I'm going to run the for loop method. What's highlighted in green is the line of code that we're about to execute. So we're about to execute the count equals one. That's the initialization. Cool. At this point, count equals one. The line of green is what we're about to evaluate. We're now going to check the condition. Just like the while loop, we check the condition before we ever run the body of the for loop. Is count less than or equal to five? Yep, that's true. Here's where things are confusing, potentially. The next line of code that executes is the body. We skipped right over this code. Okay? We don't do the third part of the for loop yet. So the debugger helps us visually see that. If I hit step again, the next line of code that's executed that's, now we're back, we jump back up here to increment the loop variable. The count plus plus executes next. It goes to two. The next line of code that's executed is count is less than or equal to five. We're checking that condition again. Is that true? It is. So we jump down here to print the body. Here's what I want you to do. In your head, Make a prediction. What is the next line of code that's going to be executed? What is the next line of code that is going to be highlighted in green? Okay. And then I'm going to hit step, and you're going to see if you're right. The next line of code is incrementing that loop variable, the third part of the fourth state. All right, same exercise again. In your head, predict. What is the next line of code that's going to be executed? That is, which one are we going to highlight in green? I'm going to hit step. It's checking the condition. One final time, predict in your head, what is the next line of code that's going to be executed? That is highlighted in green. I'm going to hit step. It's the body of the floor. The reason, in, in my opinion, the reason why it takes a little bit of time to get comfortable with floor loops is because the flow of execution is like all over the place. We're bouncing back and forth. Sometimes we go backwards. Sometimes we go forward. Sometimes we skip lines. It takes some getting used to. I write my for loops over three lines 
because when we debug it now in BlueJ, we can visually see which of the three parts is executing when. I think that's really powerful as we're getting comfortable with for loops. When you read the text, when you look at code online, you're going to usually see a for loop written in a single line of code. Later this unit, we will do that. Just here at the beginning, I'm splitting it in three lines of code to help us be able to use the debugger to tell which part is executing what. Okay. That's why it might look a little bit different than what you see in the text. All right, something I want to show you here is let's say we also wanted to print the value of count at the end. System.out.println final value of count. count. We get a compiler error. This is probably unexpected. It says there's an undeclared variable count. Which we might be surprised by because very clearly we declared the variable count right here. Now we did learn when we were doing our if statements that if we declare a variable inside of the curly brackets block of an if statement, that variable is only scoped, only accessible within those curly brackets. But this variable is clearly outside of these curly brackets. Okay? So we would think it would be accessible. Um, but that's not the way Java behaves. So just to explain what's going on here, variables declared within the for statement, meaning inside the parentheses after the for keyword here, are scoped to the for statement and its body. So basically all of this is considered its own scope. So if we declare a variable inside the for statement, it's limited to being used within the for statement in the body. Um, we can't use it anywhere else. So I'm going to comment this out so our code still compiles. I share that with you just so like you can watch out for that. Okay? So when you get that compiler error, you're not like, oh, I don't know what to do. You're like, oh, I've seen this before. I have a scoping issue. I need to fix it. So let's fix it. Let's write another method that fixes it. Public static void, for example, two. Let's copy the for loop and the print done. Let's copy the final value thing. And let's, let's fix it. The way we fix it is we have to declare the variable before we get to the for statement. So we need to do it up here. We need to say int count up here. And then inside the for loop, we can still initialize it. This compiles just fine because the scope of the variable count, because we've declared it in the scope of the method, we can now refer to it here. It's not limited just to the for statement and its body. Easy fix. A couple of little things I just want to point out because you might run across them and I don't want you to be surprised. These aren't huge deals. They don't show up that often. We could say like int count equals one all on the same line, in which case this line of code isn't, or that part of the statement isn't needed. We can actually delete it and this still compiles. We don't have to have, the, we still need the semicolon here, but we don't have to have anything for the first part. Okay. Um, same is true of the third part. We could get rid of the third part here. We could add this down here if you wanted. This still compiles. This is a really funny looking for statement. 
we still have the two semicolons. If we were to do something like this, we might as well just use a while loop. This is a while loop at this point, right? So that's kind of silly. But I just wanted to share with you and point out that the first and third parts are optional. They don't have to be there in the for statement, but we got to have the semicolons. And we have to have the condition. All right, cool. Let's do one more example together. Or at least start it. Public static void. We're going to call this off by one. Let's say we want to print five stars, five asterisk characters. We've been using count so far to be consistent with the while loop and the for loop. Often in the for loop, we use a variable i. So we'd say like for int i equals zero. And again, that's our initialization. We would then say i is less than or equal to five. That's our condition. i plus plus. That's our update the loop variable. System.out.println asterisk star. That's our body. And for good measure, let's print when we're done so we know what's going on. So type it, compile it, run this method, check the output. I'm going to do the same. Oops, close that window. Run off by one. I have one, two, three, four, five, six stars, and then it prints done. We wanted five stars. We got six stars. Why? Yeah, so i is going to be 0, and then 1, and then 2, and then 3, and then 4, and then 5. Counting on my fingers, I'm up to 6 stars. Okay. This is so common, a bug, that it's like infamous. So this is the infamous off by 1 error. It's so common that like computer scientists and software engineers joke about it all the time. Like, oh, that's an off by one error, wherever it shows up like in life. Um, but it's really common. It is common with for loops and while loops, but certainly for loops. What happens is it's executing one too many, like in this case, or one too few times. It is really tempting. Well, so how do we solve this? We just have to ask the right question. We need to carefully ask, should the initial value start at 0 or 1? That's a really important question. And should the condition be less than or less than or equal to? Also a really important question. 
it is really tempting when you end up with one of these bugs to just change something and see if it fixes it, okay? But here is advice from a former student that's like so good, we'll put it right in our comments here. Their advice is think. Don't compile and try at random. Stop and think. Don't just randomly change things until it works. You gotta understand what it should be. There are conventions for for loops. They're best practices. So by convention, for simple for loops, we always start at zero and we use the less than symbol. So many things start at zero in computer science, right? Like the indexes to our uh, strings. So we would write this int i equals zero, i is less than or equal to five. This should be i is less than five. That's the standard way of writing it. Could we do i equals one, i is less than or equal to five? Yep, absolutely, it would work. But other people are gonna expect you to start at zero and use less than instead of less than or equal to. So we're gonna follow that convention. We're gonna make our code easy for other people to understand. All right, this is a great place to pause.